Today, Mike is going to take a look at the Barents Sea in Norway. Lots of potential, but little production to date. We also have an exclusive offer where you can get free access to our data. You don't want to miss out on this. Over to Mike. So, what's happening in the Barents Sea? Well, back in April 2023, Director General of the NOD, Torgeir Stordal, he was speaking at a Hammerfest conference and he said, well, there's just not enough exploration going on in the Barents Sea. He, he probably didn't use those actual words, but as I wasn't there and don't speak Norwegian, I'll have to do for now. Anyway, let's have a look at the status of exploration in the Barents Sea. Well, we start as ever by finding out, well, where is the Barents Sea? Well, this map of Norway here and uh, this area highlighted, this is the part of the Barents Sea, which stretches a long way to the north and to the east. But it's this area here that we're going to be looking at today where the oil and gas discoveries have been uh, made to date. Here's our HQ down here uh, in Aberdeen. Now, for those uh, who are watching this video to the end, we've got an amazing offer. Well, we could jump into the deep end and uh, have a look at this. It's a compilation put together by the, the amazing Eddie Ong, who publishes on uh, LinkedIn. And this one is from a few years ago, but let's uh, break it down into bite-sized chunks. So here's a structural elements map. You can see here's the area highlighted, and these are the uh, the major features you can see here: the Lopper High, the Hammerfest Basin, for example. Um, but don't really get a sense of the basin from this and what's going on. Well, you can look at the stratigraphy. All the ingredients for a working petroleum system are here. This is a simplified stratigraphy from PGS. Doesn't tell the full picture, but you know, it's a great start. Now, in terms of reservoirs, we've got here the Stowe Reservoir in the Jurassic and sandstone reservoirs here in the Permian Carboniferous and perhaps a limestone target down here in the Basal Permian. In terms of seals, well, we've got lots of thick shales here up in the Cretaceous, uh, Jurassic, and various other places throughout the column. And in terms of source rocks, well, we've got uh, organic rich shales here in the Triassic, and again in the Upper Jurassic. And in fact, some, some argue, and there's some case, that uh, there could be significant source potential within the Cretaceous. This is good, but I still i am not getting a sense of the basin. Ah, this is what we need. A cross section. Now it's sort of uh, stylized. It's a uh, west to east cross section. And uh, we can really start to see what's going on here. We've got the Carboniferous, which is just above the basement here. After that, we've got these uh, Permian layers, followed by a thick Triassic. And this was a Triassic deeper center here. But obviously, it has subsequently been uh, uplifted, inverted, and uh, eroded. And there's a massive, great unconformity around. Now, after the Triassic, we get a thin Upper Jurassic. So we did see on that previous slide uh, that the Upper Jurassic was a source rock. Well, you know, it's thicker in some of these deeper parts of the basin here, but missing over much of the Lopper High and, and quite thin in this platform area here. So after that, we get the uh, Cretaceous, the greens of the Cretaceous. And again, a big, thick, deeper center here and here, but essentially it's all been eroded and removed from on top of this big regional high here. And then after that, we've got the lower tertiary, followed by the upper tertiary, and here the quaternary. So now it's kind of building out into a um, more of a passive margin, but for a lot of the history of this basin, it has had this inversion. There's going to be uh, several periods of structuring, folding, uplift, and erosion. There's major unconformities in the section. It's not at all like the typical cross-section and the typical passive margin you get in, say, the North Sea or along much of the Atlantic margin. So uh, that's really brought the geology to life. And now we can go back and have a look at the stratigraphic column and have a look again at those structural elements and make more sense of them. So here's the discoveries today. This is the Barents Sea. And uh, here's all the wells indicated here. This is the top end of Norway. And you can see they're relatively relatively close to shore, although there's the scale. There's 100 kilometers. So when you start talking about visiting here, it's you know 400 kilometers from these islands. So it is a long way. Now, it's estimated that only 6% of the resources have been produced in the Barents Sea. And that in terms of area that's been explored, it's only about 30% of the total area which has been opened up for petroleum activities. So it's a relatively 
immature basin, there has been quite a significant amount of drilling. And there have been some successes, but um, it really hasn't been another Norwegian Sea, or for that matter, or Norwegian North Sea, in terms of the prolific amount of reserves that it delivers up. So there are only two producing fields in the Barents Sea. One's Goliath, which obviously is Goliath in English, and Snowvit, which is Snow White. There we go. Oil at Goliath and gas condensate at Snowvit. What you can see here is our trove entries for each of these assets. Lots of material on both these assets. And in the case of Trove, find all this material readily and quickly at the click of a button. And from that, we'll have a quick look at uh, both of these fields in a bit more detail. Now, uh, Goliath here in a little more detail. We just pull these out of our Trove and we can make these montages in a matter of minutes. If you've got all the data, it's very easy to do. You can see here's the structure here. It's got a gas cap sitting above the oil. Here's a sort of seismic line showing the complex segmented inverted anticlinal feature. You can see it's a Triassic Reservoir operator E&I with partners Equinor. Production to date, well, it has sort of been underperforming in the early years here. The uh, design capacity 100 to 110,000 barrels of oil per day. But so far, it's only really been working at about 50% of that capacity at best. 180 million barrels of oil reserves, and it's one of these cylindrical uh, production vessels. Now, the gas currently re-injected, as there's no gas export. There's tanker offloading, uh, subsea tiebacks. All the wells are on the subsea are tied back to this geostationary FPSO, as it says on the diagram there. Now, looking at Snovit, well, for Snovit, if we look really at this uh, section down here, it, the reservoir here is the Jurassic, and you can see that it, by the looks of things, it looks like it's going to be a, a fill and spill type uh, model. It's on this rendered 3D map. You can see that there's charging from the north, which is uh, over here. North is on the right on this section towards the south. And you can see that uh, it charges up first into Snowvit Nord, then into Snowvit, the main field, and then it sort of seems to spill over here. There's a spill point perhaps at this end and it spills up into the Albatross. And there's other accumulations identified in the region here. Operated by Equinor, this is sort of some EM, that's electromagnetic response, plus the Geostream and PGS Geostreamer data that acquired simultaneously back in 2013, which actually shows the anomaly at Snovit and also at Albatross. Now, there is complexity to this field. There are different reservoirs. There are different contacts here, gas oil, oil water, and then here another oil water contact. So this is uh, how it looks here. It's all subsea, tied back to a central sort of manifold area, and then it's piped all the way directly to the beach, to the sort of Hammerfest LNG facility now. Reserves, well, 6.8 TCF of gas and 130 million barrels of condensate is quoted. So that's what uh, the two producing fields look like. Now, uh, in terms of discoveries, well, this is a list that we got from our Trove database, and you'll recognize many of those if you're familiar with this basin. Here's the next in line. This is the Johann Kassberg. And this is our entry in Trove for this particular asset. And you can see we've got lots of information gathered together. I think uh, it's due to come on stream in fourth quarter of 2024, so in a few months' time. So we might do a video when the production starts up with this. Here's Visting Central. Now, there's a lot of information for this. This is quite a northerly discovery. And because of its remoteness, really, its investment decision has been deferred. Being remote, the order of 400 kilometers from mainland Norway, there's no infrastructure to piggyback over or to share costs with. So, you know, what's it going to take to get Wisting to a, a critical mass? Now, what is the Trove advantage? Well, the vast majority of geologic and engineering data on oil and gas fields never gets published. It's not in the scientific journals. There's a limit to how much gets shown at conferences, do you find it by going through Google and just doing endless searches? Well, no, we've done that for you. We've put everything together over years. In fact, over a decade now, we've been building databases up. There's material we have in Trove that you will not find. It's gone. It's lost from the internet. So um, what have we done? Well, things like we've put in every single relinquishment report that's ever been issued by NPD or NOD. They're all contained within our trove. 
Now, I'll show you what that means in the Baron C. Here's all the prospects that we have. And if you pause the video, you can have a look. You'll probably recognize many of these. We're going to have a quick look at Tromtind. This is just an example, a prospect. This is a map here showing uh, the Tromtind prospect. It's a Carnian, Ladinian. These are Triassic prospects. It's up in the northwest, Barents Sea. And here's a depth map showing uh, the structure here. Probably comes more to life when we actually have a look at a seismic line. The Triassic are fluvial and pyrrolic sandstones, very shallow. The sequence is truncated and overlain by quaternary. That's the Nordland group shales. So um, what you can see here, it looks like some kind of hydrocarbon indicator, some brightening going on here. Most likely it's gas, but it's quite shallow. So uh, being shallow, it's got a low formation volume factor. So it doesn't expand to the same extent as gas would if it was buried a lot deeper in the section. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Here's the amplitude anomaly shown mapped here. Now it hasn't moved forward because it's considered not to be of sufficient size. But, uh, you know, this in time could be something that becomes interesting if there's more infrastructure developed within the area. Here's our entry from Trove, and you can see we've got a, an awful lot of material for this prospect here. We've captured every relinquishment report in Norway, not just for Barents. We've captured it for the Norwegian Sea and for the North Sea. In our Trove database package, that features the Barents Sea, you don't just get every field discovery and prospect in the Barents Sea, you also get every field discovery and prospect in the Norwegian Sea. So here's a list of all the assets that we have in the Norwegian Sea. Oh, and that's the second part of that list. Wouldn't fit all on one page. Or maybe rather than looking at specific assets, you want to have uh, more of an overview of what's going on in the region. Well, you can look at this. This is from Eddie Yong. Eddie is very, very prolific. He publishes an awful lot of material. So, you know, we have all this captured in Trove. And this has been various posts over the years, all collated and put together. As well as that, you get uh, various maps. And we can guarantee that by the time you see Trove for Barents Sea, you will actually see a lot more information than just that shown. Now you maybe uh, want to look at the source rocks, so maturation, migration. So uh, we have a section here that looks in the Barents Sea. Yeah, I actually have it on the Norwegian Sea. And for completeness, we just throw in what's happening in the North Sea as we go further south down the Norwegian continental shelf. Or you may just want to have a look and have a reminder of who was awarded what and where. And so you can see here the various app arounds going back for the last few years. And this gets updated all the time. Or you might want to have a look at the 25th licensing round results or the 24th licensing round results. Or did I mention we've got every field discovery and prospect in both the Barent Sea and the Norwegian Sea? Here's an example. Here's Ormond Langer. And a major gas field. It supplies uh, the UK with about 20% of its gas demand. So it's a, a major, major field and fantastic geology. But Trove isn't just about the endless pages of material illustrations, maps, sections, etc. on each asset. You can see we've actually got the data here and we've moved it across so that you can look at things like permeability versus depth, porosity versus depth, lots of other material, all collated. You can search by age and here's our dashboard that we have for the Barents Sea. And in these slices here, you can see on asset type, we've put something in there and say, well, we only want to look at the discoveries. So it's only the discoveries that are highlighted. And then we go across here and we say, well, we're actually, we're only going to be interested in the Cretaceous discoveries. Now from that, all these other things fall out. You can see that we have more in the Norwegian Sea. Oh, yes, the Norwegian Sea than in the Barents Sea. You can see a breakdown by operator. We've got the trap type here, the oil gravity, water depth. And what are the uh, fields that satisfy these criteria? Well, they're highlighted here in dark blue, and you can actually read them off the list here. And it's lightning fast to actually find your way and actually find analogs in the basin or in the adjoining basin up and down the Norwegian continental shelf. So Trove 
it inspires explorers and developers. You save valuable time and you can find lots and lots of data that you probably miss if you were just doing endless Google searches. You know how time consuming they can be. Trove is a quick reference without having to hunt endlessly. You can find the information that's never been published in journals. You can find NPD and NOD data in a fraction of the time that you'd even find it on their website. So all put together really sort of logically. And we can guarantee you won't find as much information in one easy to navigate application like Trove. And also, and this is interesting, we guarantee we won't be beaten on price. Why is that? Well, we're giving it away free. An evaluation license, that is, and it's essentially free. And not only that, but we'll give a free tailored training session for your team. All you have to do, send us an email. Now, there's the small print. Pause the video and read it. Why are we doing this? You may ask. Have we gone crazy? Well, some of the team asked me that. Well, we're a small company, basically, and we recognize we can't do everything. And what we want to do is focus on what we do best, and that is the research, collating, putting the material together, recognizing the significance of material. So it's a lot of human intelligence goes into this, not artificial intelligence, human intelligence. But we don't have enough time for marketing and sales. We really should be doing more of that, but there's not enough of us. So we believe that once you've used this trove, you'll want to talk to us about having access to other troves around the rest of the globe. And we'll guarantee that your current provider won't be able to match trove for value and global coverage. And what does that look like? Well, it looks something like this. These are the areas of the world. We're adding to this all the time, and I can guarantee this map will look even more full next time you come back to our channel. Thank you for watching. I hope you found that interesting. Please hit the like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Hope to see you back on our channel before too long. Bye for now.